It's a full text right there. We've got a lot to walk through this morning. If you're new, welcome. My name's Josh. Like I said earlier, I'm one of the pastors here. I'm super glad to be here with you at 1045. And part of Redemption's sort of legacy is we don't really think we have a lot to offer in and of ourselves, but we think if we open up God's word, he'll speak to us every time. Part of that is great because we're always just kind of in a book walking through. Part of that is if you're new, you always, uh, if you're coming to church, you're kind of entering into a conversation midway through. So just to sort of catch us up, not on the whole story of scripture or anything, but in this particular place, where are we? What is the context of what Andrew just read? I just want to read the last part of the last verse, verse 31. Jesus says this, rise, let us go from here. This is the end of Jesus' life. John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 are Jesus' sort of final words for his disciples and by extension, us who love Jesus in this room. Here's what I have to say before I go to the cross. Rise. Where is he rising to go? He's going to the cross. It reminds me a lot of September 11th. We just passed. Obviously, it was a 20-year reunion, so I was watching a lot of stuff. And for some reason, I hadn't spent nearly as much time just kind of diving into the significance. I was a teenager when it happened, but it hit me hard. I'll, I mean, there was a ton of documentaries, but one in particular is reading uh, about Todd Beamer, the guy on United Flight 93 who had two young kids. He, his wife was pregnant, and uh, they have parts of his transcript of him and a few other people saying, we are going to take this plane down because we know they're up to something no good, and we must intervene. And the last recorded words are, You guys ready? Let's roll. Todd Beamer. Nobody's heard from him since. He went on. Rise. Let's go. This is Jesus. Are you guys ready? Let's roll moment. Are you guys ready? Let's roll. And here's what we learn as we go to the life of the disciples. They are not ready. They got a lot they still got to figure out. So John 13 through 17 is a lot of Jesus teaching because he's still got a lot to teach him. Because when he says, are you guys ready? Let's roll. They still have a lot to figure out. And that's this moment here we find ourselves in here. Jesus is talking. He's in the middle of, here's what I want to tell my people before I go. Specifically, here's what I want to tell these 11 disciples who have seen me do everything. Everything important before I go on to take on the cross. And the disciples prove over and over again they don't get it. Specifically, here's what they don't get. They don't get the kingdom of God. How it's going to be inaugurated, how it's going to be kicked off, what it's going to look like, what it's going to feel like. They just have a misunderstanding of the kingdom of God. They are not, none of them are atheists. They all believe in God. They all believe in one God. They all believe one God is going to send one Messiah. They all believe all that. But as far as all the details, they are always running into issues. Just like in a church full of Christians who love Jesus, know the only way to the Father is through Jesus, one day are going to spend eternity face-to-face with the Savior they love. In this room, we have lots of people who don't get a lot of what we're supposed to get. And I think that's what this passage is going to do, is just kind of refocus us on what the kingdom of God is. So here's sort of the big statement, the big idea. The kingdom of God is manifested. It's made known. It's made clear. It's made obvious. How? Through Jesus' loving Spirit-filled followers. If I had to summarize the text we just read, that's what it is. The kingdom of God is manifested through Jesus-loving, spirit-filled followers. That's what we're going to walk through. We're just going to kind of walk through that statement and pull out from this passage where I think that comes from. That's what we're doing uh, this morning. I just want to stop for a second, just kind of quiet my heart, our hearts, and just ask God to speak to us. So let's pray real quickly. Father, We hear a lot of voices in the week, outside voices, internal voices. We need one voice to rise above the rest. So God, that's what we want, your voice to be heard. We want to follow your voice. So speak to us this morning, Lord. We love you. Jesus, name we pray. Amen. So that's what we're doing, walking through. Here's the first thing I want to look at. The kingdom of God is manifested. The kingdom of God. So what were the Jews expecting to happen when Jesus said, are you guys ready? Let's roll. They expected something important to happen, but is it lined up with what Jesus was going to do and what was going to follow after Jesus' uh, death and resurrection? Absolutely not. Let's just look and just pull it out of this verse. Go to verse 22, please. Judas who is not Iscariot, has a statement that sort of enters us into the confusion of the disciples. So verse 22, 
All this whole section is Jesus talking except for this little interjection. Verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Pause right there. Because this whole section is Jesus saying what he's going to do in and through the disciples. He doesn't talk about the world per se. And the disciples, what they understood was the world was going to be led and run by the king of the Jews. God makes a promise to them all throughout the Old Testament. He goes to Abraham. He says, I'm going to bless you. There's going to be so many of you you're not even going to understand. And anyone that blesses you, I'll bless. Anyone that curses you, I'll curse. Abraham starts off this sort of lineage of promises from God to his people. And then he meets with Moses. Moses, I'm going to bless you if you guys keep this covenant. Here's the rules. Here's the statutes. Here's the way I want this people of God thing to feel. This is what I want you to be like. And he makes another promise with Moses. And then fast forward a little further. He makes a promise to David. And on your throne, David, someone is going to be the king of Israel always who comes from your line. There's going to be a king that will not have an end to his kingdom. So the Jews, that's their backdrop as they think about the Messiah. We're going to be blessed. God has spoken to us. We have the law. We have the Torah. And the king of Israel will rule not only Israel, but the whole world one day. That's what the 11 have all churning in their head and in their heart as Jesus is kind of having his last moment with them. We know God's going to act on behalf of Israel for the sake of the world. If I had to summarize kind of what I think just baseline thought was, here's what I think the Jews, the disciples were thinking. The kingdom of God will be manifested through the Messiah, the enemy-crushing king of Israel. Meaning, they expected the king to come and squash out all the issues they had, namely the issues they thought they had were not internal but external. In this current day, it was Rome. Rome was in charge. The Jews were a religious minority now. The king is going to come. And we will not be the religious minority more. He will rule and our king will be the king of the world. That's what they're waiting for. So Judas asked the question, how are you going to just, man, how is that truth just going to be applied to me when the world's not going to, that makes no sense to me. Why? Because they had a different view. They were looking ahead to something that wasn't totally accurate. And as I've been preparing, I just kind of thought, asked myself, what are the things that I'm, banking on, hoping for in my life. And there's kind of two ways to do that, the honest way and the church way. So the, uh, the church way is to say, well, Jesus, obviously. And it's like, yeah, maybe. But what are the things that kind of draw my attention into the future, that pull me, that keep me going? And if I'm honest, the best way I could describe it for me, at least in this season of life, is like benchmarks of success that I can get to. It's like, what's the next thing that will say, all right, I've been doing a good job. Planning a church, what's the, okay, three years seems to be a marker. Three years is when. That's what I'm hoping for. And I think for all of us, we've got these things that we're looking out to, like, oh, marriage, kids, health getting better, retirement, this money to cash, all. Oh. And those are not bad in and of themselves. But as Christians, we have to stop and pause and sometimes ask, what's the canvas? What's the painting behind all those things that we're looking ahead to? Is it the kingdom of God being fully realized here on earth? Or is it some version of little kingdoms that we've sort of created for ourselves? And I'm the first to admit, like, my mental energies have not been going towards the kingdom of God coming down to earth. And that might be a stage of life thing. I mean, I got little kids. I don't even have time to think, let alone think deep thoughts about Jesus. I just yell at the kids and then try to get a little bit of silence. <laughs> but as we look at the disciples missing, being off on what they were looking ahead to, we have to stop and say, How, where am I off on what I'm looking ahead to? And Jesus kind of takes Judas' question now and starts to kick us in the direction of what the kingdom of God is actually going to be like. Look at verse 23 there. How does Jesus respond to yet another disciple who does not get it? He does what he does. He sort of doesn't even answer their question. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Pause right there. The kingdom of God is not what you think. The kingdom of God is defined by this love. And not just love from God towards us, but love from us towards God. If anyone loves 
me, Judas, they'll keep my commandments. Jesus sort of switches the conversation, says the kingdom of God is not what you're thinking, it's about love. And the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is here now. In the theological world, in redemption, we like to use this language. The kingdom of God is already here, but not yet, meaning it has started. The kingdom of God is here at hand. Those of us by faith who trust Jesus are in the kingdom of God, and yet we are waiting for the day where it's most fully realized here on earth. But we are in the kingdom of God. Well, what defines the kingdom of God? Jesus is going to say love. Specifically, it's for people who love me. Period. Like if I just had this passage to define Christianity, I would not use the word Christian to define whatever we are. If I just had this passage, I would use the word love. Well, what is this thing? These are the Jesus lovers. That's what this thing is. These are the people that love Jesus. Well, you got a better word for that? Maybe, but according to this, that's it. We love Jesus, period. That's what this is about. We are the ones who love Jesus. Which takes us to our next section. The kingdom of God is manifested through us. Jesus-loving, spirit-filled followers. Here's what's fascinating as I've studied this. Is this is a sort of switch from how Jesus has been talking about love up to this point. At least according to the author, John. Not that he's now using a different definition or he's been lying this whole time. But the focus of love, Jesus has been for his love towards us. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. Why? Because I love you. I'm going to the cross. I will be punished for your sins. Why? Because I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And then chapter 14, middle of it, Jesus sort of switches. He's like, now let's talk about you. Do you love me? Where Read verse 21 there, or verse 15. This is the kickoff of this section here. That sort of highlights the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The love Jesus has for us is the most important thing any of us will ever realize or understand in this life and the life to come. But I think often faithful Christians, myself included, talk so much about the love Jesus has for us, God has for us, that we forget to stop and say, this is a relationship. He loves me, but do I love him? I think about parent relationships. Like if you're a good parent in the room, this is what it's going to be like for you. Time will tell with me, but this is how it works with my dad. It's a very lopsided affair. My dad does most of the heavy lifting. Financially, relationally, listen to stuff he doesn't want me to listen to. Why? Because he's a good dad. Because the little kid years, it's like, I'm keeping these creatures alive. I'm pouring into these. It's a very one-sided. And then we, now we're both adults. And I often think, dad does most of the work. Like, I just assume he's the one that's going to put in extra amount of work. And it was confirmed to me. I was at this training, and they told you to pair off. And I got uh, paired up with this older guy. In the, I don't know if this was the Holy Spirit or what, but he says, here's what I'd like you to know, youngster. <laughs> Your parents are real people. And so often, kids forget that their older parents, whatever older is to you, are real people. And a relationship done well is a two-way street. And my dad is such a good dad that it's so easy to just to receive, to receive, to receive, to receive. And I forget to stop and say, do I love him? Yes, I love him. Well, how have I showed him recently? And I think that's what Jesus is doing here. Before I go, do you love me? That's what we're going to talk about. Do you love me? And I just want to look at how Jesus sort of summarizes all that he has to say about love, at least in this section. So we're going to look through these verses here. You can see them on the the screen there. But verse 15, verse 21, verse 23, verse 24, verse 28. Let's kind of get all Jesus' words together and see what he says. So verse 15, I just read it, but I'm going to read it again. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Fast forward, verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is. Who loves me? Verse 23. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In verse 28, this one's just 
beautiful words from Jesus. Verse 28, you heard me say to you that I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. Pause right there. Jesus is saying, I get this is a one-way street and I'm doing all the heavy lifting. But if you love me, you would have been happy for me that I'm going away to the Father because he's greater than I and being with him is going to be greater. But you're so self-focused, Josh. You don't ever stop and think, do I love Jesus? And how am I showing my love for him? But that's what Jesus is doing. He's like, all right, you guys ready? It's time to roll. Do you love me? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's sort of the summary statement. How would Jesus summarize what he's saying here in regards to love? This is it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, period. Now, if you have any sort of church background, you could hear this and head off into some very legalistic strands very quickly. But we want God's word to speak, and he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Here's sort of a question. What's Jesus' tone in this? Is Jesus doubtful here? Like me with my kids, expecting them to get chores done in a timely manner. <laughs> Definitely not. Is Jesus challenging them, like sort of bowing up, like a coach, like getting, if you love me, you will obey me. Here's the tone, I think. It's a very encouraging, exhorting promise he's making to his people. Hey, just so you know, I'm going away. You guys love me. And if you love me, here's what your life's going to, you will obey my commandments. Because none of these words, none of these verbs in this section are commands. Jesus is making promise statements about reality. If you love me, disciples, you will keep my commandments. I think Jesus is giving this as a sign and a test of our true love for him. What's the sign that we love Jesus? We keep his commandments. What's the test that we love Jesus? We keep his commandments. Like if others ask you, are you a Christian? Well, what, 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 what makes you a Christian? Like, what's our answer? According to this, it's, I love Jesus. Well, then the follow-up question was, well, how do you know you love Jesus? Because I love a lot of things. And Jesus say, well, I keep his commandments. And some of you that are like, more rule follower, are like, how many? What percentage of the commandments? Like, <laughs> that word keep is sort of, uh, bringing into alignment with. Your life is marked by someone who is bringing God's word to your life and lining up your life with what God has to say through the person of Jesus. That's it. Percentage-wise, I don't know. Last week, it was like 62% for me. I don't know about you. But are we growing in our affection for Jesus? If so, we will be growing in our desire and want to keep, to line our lives with his commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's Jesus' statement. That should be really encouraging for some of you. That should also sort of not sit well with some of you. Because God's word is meant to encourage and to uplift, but also to challenge and convict those that need to be challenged and convicted. If you love me, do you love me? Yes. How do you? You'll keep my commandments. You will line up your life with my words. And I love Jesus says, all my commandments. It's Jesus' sort of subtle nod to his deity. You will keep all my commandments. Where are the commandments he's talking about? All of them. And he says, they're mine. I'm God. What's he talking about? Anything he said, at any moment, line up your life with me. In the, just so you know, in the Gospel of John, if we're just looking at this context, there's only two times Jesus makes a command that's sort of an action that somebody can act on. A couple chapters prior, he tells the disciples, love one another like I loved you. So love one another. And then fast forward, Peter, a couple chapters, Peter, feed my sheep. If you love me, you'll feed my sheep. Those are the only two commandments if you were to dissect just the gospel of John where there's like an actionable thing. More than anything else in the gospel of John, here's the command on our life. Command on your life, command on my life. Believe, 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 believe. Believe. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. According to the Gospel of John, if you love me, you will believe. You will believe. You will trust. You will press in by faith. You will trust. You will believe. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Summary statement. The kingdom of God is not a Jewish king that is destroying enemies. 
necessarily. The kingdom of God for now that we are participating in, that we have been invited into, is Jesus lovers living out their life, proving their love by keeping his commandments. Imperfectly, inconsistently, I get all that. But that's what the kingdom of God is. What they had in mind was something altogether. It was a total destruction and a total success for Israel. And Jesus says, ah, we'll get there. But for now, love me and keep my commandments. Who's the kingdom of God for? It's for those who want to love Jesus. And he's gracious enough to do the gift of even helping our hearts love him to begin with, which is fascinating. Which takes us to our last point, and this is where we're going to camp out. The kingdom of God is manifested through Jesus-loving, spirit filled followers. This passage is one of the greatest pictures of the Trinity in all of Scripture. Orthodox Christians, Roman, Eastern Orthodox Christians, Presbyterians, all sorts, all the churches around here that you may never go to because you disagree with them on this. Almost every church around here agrees on this. Father, Son, and Spirit. They are God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. And at the same time, the Father is not the same as the Son of the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the same as the Father and the Son. And the Son is not the same as the Father and the Spirit. But they are all God at the same time and distinct from one another. And where do Christians get that doctrine from? From the Bible. And at this particular passage, we see it sort of played out. We see that in I, I, it's like a divi- divine dance between Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father gives. Jesus asks the Father, and the Father gives what Jesus asked for. And then the Spirit comes in response to the Son asking the Father to give. And then the Spirit highlights the Father and Son and points back to them and says, you really need to look at them. They're the, they're the stars of this. And you see this beautiful sort of interplay of perfect relationship. When we think about relationship, the Trinity is our basis as Christians. It's mutually giving, mutually sacrificial, submitting to one another out of love in perfect harmony is the word. This is where we get our basis for any sort of relationship in the church is the Trinity. And in this passage, we see it played out. But what's beautiful about this passage is Jesus and the Father sort of say, hey, I, want, I want to brag about the Spirit for a bit. And this section is sort of, let's talk about the Spirit and its role in the life of Christians and churches from Jesus' day till now. So that's, I just want, they're all going to be on the, sc- the screen here. But what is the Spirit? Who is the Spirit? What does the Spirit do in the life of Christians based off this? What does it mean to be spirit Field. So we're going to walk through and you're going to see them on here. But here's the first thing I see about the Spirit. The Spirit is called the Helper. Where do I see that? Go to verse, right in the beginning, verse uh, 16. Jesus is speaking. I will ask the Father, also God, and he will give you another Helper to be with you forever. Down in the, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. The Spirit is called the Helper. What a beautiful name to give someone. The first time that name was given in the Bible was given to who? Eve. Adam's made. This world is beautiful. God's like, that's good, that's good. I love how I did that. That is beautiful, that is beautiful. Made Adam from the dust of the earth, and he's sitting there, and he's like, ah, this something's not right here. I will send him a helper, same language, to be with him. Like a Christian life with Jesus without the Spirit is like Adam without Eve. It's like, it's good. But God says something is very good. He says it's very good when he creates Eve and the helper now arrives. That's very good. And that's what we see in this passage. Jesus is like, this is good. Guys, this is good. You guys are boneheads, but mostly this is good. But one day, Very soon, the helper's coming, and you're going to have Jesus and the helper, and it's going to be very good. How do we make sense of the Holy Spirit, the most sort of mysterious part of the Trinity? Like the Father, we can make sense of because we have a picture of what a Father's supposed to be. The Son, we have a lot of stuff written about Jesus Christ, the Son. And the Spirit is this sort of mysterious, even some denominations, the Holy Ghost, which is like, wow, that is really So the best thing in my life is a ghost who happens to be holy, but this is what we're talking about, the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. 
And I think if, I, if I'm going to take the language of helper, like, think of all the ways a women in your life just make it better. Like, if your life was to have your mother removed, or if you married your spouse, or one of your, what God would call helpers, Eve, she's going to be a helper. Like, life would just not be that good. My house would be terrible. Me and the dudes, and then the helper gone. It's like, get me out of here. Come back, Lord Jesus. Why? Because Aubrey is a helper. And don't hear that word like man, woman. Man, woman, woman comes to help and make everything better. And that is the language used of God the Spirit. So ladies, helper is a good thing. It's used to describe the third person of the Trinity. That's a beautiful thing. Like, where would we be without the helpers in our life? It would be brutal. Like, I, I was part of this very contentious, behind-the-scenes disagreement. All men not getting along. Months and months and months, they're still not figuring it out. It's like, all right, let's get more guys involved. Let's figure this out. And one of the guys one time said, you know, my wife said, have you ever thought about letting the wives come in and help you out? It hadn't crossed any of our minds. <laughs> Why? Because we need help. And that is what the go God in his word calls the spirit. He's here to help, just like Eve was there to help. And ladies living in the image of God are helpers. The Holy Spirit is a helper. That's the first thing we see. Here's the next thing. The Spirit is a gift that is given. Where do I see that? Go to verse 16. <clears throat> and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. He will give you. He will gift is the word there. The Spirit is a gift given to who? Acts says it this way. Peter preaches this wonderful message. People are like, all right, I like it. I want to buy into what these Jews who used to be just straight Jewish and now they're talking about Jesus. I want this. And he says, here's what you need to do. Repent and believe and the Spirit of God will be given to you. How do you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? You repent and believe in the person of Jesus and the Spirit is given to you as a gift. Even as Jesus talks about prayer as a way of children asking the Father for gifts, how does he talk about it? He says, first he uses earthly fathers. He's like, how many earthly fathers, if your son asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion or a rattlesnake? He's like, none of you would. And you guys are evil, short-sighted, impatient, very average dads. How much more will your heavenly Father give you good gifts to those of you who ask? And there's two times that passage is in the Bible. One in Matthew, one in Luke. But Matthew says, I will give you good gifts. Luke says this, how much more will the Father give the Spirit to those who ask? And I think it's God's poetic way to say, I'll give you gifts. I'll give you the house you're asking for, and I'll give you gifts from time to time, and they'll be good. But the best gift I could give you is the Spirit. And I will give the Spirit to those who ask. It's a gift that's been given. Here's the third thing we see. The Spirit is with us forever. Verse 16. He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Reading through this passage, preparing for this passage, was the first time I realized I don't have any sort of memory verses or like uh, places in the Bible to go to talk about the longevity of my relationship with the Spirit. I have a lot as I think about Jesus. Jesus says, I'll be with you to the ends of the age. Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Jesus and my eternity together are sealed according to what I read in Scripture. But also this passage reminds us the Spirit is with us forever. And as we think about eternity, where we are heading is heaven and earth coming together in perfection here on earth. Shalom restored. That's the Jewish word for peace. What is that going to be like? It's going to be relationship with who? Father, Son, Son and spirit forever. Where do I bank that on? Verse 16, I will give you the spirit. And God, when he gives a gift, he does not take it back. He will give it to you forever. What's the next thing we see? The spirit dwells with us now. That word dwell in the New Testament is tabernacled. God set up his tabernacle here on earth. God is dwelling amongst us. How is God dwelling amongst us in this room, in this moment, in our homes, in our works, as we go about life? By his spirit, the spirit dwells. 
That's already happened in the New Testament up to this point before Jesus promises to give you more of the Spirit. Jesus' birth was done by the Holy Spirit. Mary conceives a child because the Holy Spirit's involved. Jesus is led into the wilderness to be tempted by who? The Spirit. Says The Spirit says, come on, Jesus, and he leads him into temptation. Jesus is confirmed in ministry in the temple. It says the Spirit descended upon him. Jesus' baptism, the Spirit is there like a dove. So the Spirit is dwelling in the activity of God. Where God is at work, he's at work because the Spirit is dwelling there. And that's what we see. Jesus says he is going to dwell with you. That's good news. Wherever two are gathered, I am with you. How is that possible? By the Spirit of God. We'll get to the Spirit that's in me, but for now, we just the Spirit is among us. That's a beautiful gift. It's mysterious, I get it, but the Spirit is with us. The Spirit dwells with us. Jesus can't dwell with us bodily until he comes back. So what did he do to fix that problem? He sent his spirit to dwell with us. I mean, that's all the church really is. Like, what makes this group of people any different than another group of people meeting in here? The spirit makes us who we are. Even in the book of Revelation, which I would love to teach at some point because it's crazy and it's going to make me dive into stuff that's just insane. But the very beginning is fairly understandable. It's John talking to the churches of the day in all these places, which is in now modern-day Turkey. He's like, hey, church here, you're doing this good, but you're missing this. You used to love Jesus deeply, but I see you wandering. And he gives all these sort of assessments on the churches of the day back at when the New Testament was written. But here's the scariest thing. To some of the churches, he says, God will remove your lampstand. Translation, God will take his presence from you, and you will not be a church in the sense that God says something is a church. You'll be a gathering of people. You might do a lot of stuff. You might raise a lot of money. You might change the community in massive ways. But if the spirit of God is not with you, what's the point? Why? Because the spirit dwells with you. That's what makes this beautiful, the spirit of God dwelling with us. More than that, though, the next thing, the Spirit is in us. Verse 17, let's look there. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, so it's not just generously given to all, the world will not receive it, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you. More than that, John says, or Jesus says, and will be in you. The Spirit of God is living in us. Which, if you've grown up in a Christian home, that's kind of the most christian thing to say. And it's also the truest thing we can say. And it matters a lot, even if it sounds weird and hard to grasp and understand fully what that means. The Spirit of God dwells in us. Like, what is the best thing about me? The Spirit of God dwells within me. What hope does my family have For a good family culture, the Spirit of God dwells within me. What hope do you have as a doctor, as a nurse, in your job to make any sort of difference? The Spirit of God dwells in you by faith in Jesus Christ. Like the best thing about us is not our ethnicity or academics. Like I don't even know what half of me is. I was adopted. I don't want to do the work to pay somebody to tell me I got a Scandinavian second uncle. I don't really care. I know half of me because I know my birth mom. I don't know my birth father. But I know that the Spirit dwells in me, and that's more than enough. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Like oftentimes when I've got a hard sort of work thing to do, sometimes it's a funeral, you know, and I'm like, am I prepared for this? And the answer is no. And I'm like, how do I live into the moment, this moment where I'm not prepared? What I have to offer is not enough but I have the Spirit of God in me, and the Spirit of God is the only thing that can make anything happen. There's a song by Lauren Daigle, Dry Bones, and I listen to it, and it's, about, it's out of Ezekiel, where the Spirit of God takes these dry bones and brings them to life and turns them into these beautiful people. It was Ezekiel's way to talk about the New Testament church. What is the church? It's the dry bones that have come alive. Why have we come alive? Because the Spirit is in us now. Dry bones have come alive. Why? Because the Spirit has been placed in us by God. What's the next thing we see? The Spirit teaches us. Verse 26. So he's in us. He's not just chilling there. He's not just hanging out. He's actually doing stuff now that he's in us. Verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. 
That word there, teach, is sort of the teach word for connecting the dots. The Spirit now is in you, and He will connect the dots for you. Translation, we don't have to have all the answers. We can't read enough books. We can't listen to enough podcasts. We can't be in enough counseling sessions. We can't do enough on our own to have the answers necessary to live in this life. Here's what we can do. Take this as a promise that the Spirit of God is in us and he will teach you all things. That is good news. I have the Spirit of God in me and I'm going to face all these situations. Like we got a lot of young families in here and here's where parenting for me got hard. When there was two of them that both could lie to me using their words. Before that, it was like, all right, Elijah, you're sinning. It's obvious. I'm, I'm going to, let's go into this room, and I'll punish Elijah. I'll do this. Uh, Roman, you're obviously lying. And now there's two, and I say, Elijah, Roman, what happened? And they give contradictory stories, and I was like, it was Elijah. No, it wasn't. And I've just had my butt handed to me in parenting as all my kids now can talk, and they all can lie, and they all can kind of tear ver- tell various stories versions of the story i am constantly every day in this situation where i do not know what to do as a parent and he says well the spirit of god is in you he will teach you all things pray about it dad and Aubrey's like i don't want that i didn't sign up for this <laughs> the spirit of god will teach you all things and the next thing we see the spirit will also remind us verse 26 there as well the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sends in my name, he will teach you all things. And what else will you do? He will bring to remember your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Spirit of God is also the Spirit of remembrance. He's the reminder. And just in this context, just remember, he's reminding the apostles of what he said and did as they go off to write the Scripture. So as we think about why we can trust this Bible, there's lots of scientific reasons why and the manuscripts we have. But at this core, why I trust this is because God says his spirit was the one that carried these apostles along as they remembered what happened and wrote it down. How could they remember? Because the spirit of God helped them remember. And it's no different in this room in our lives today. God is calling to remembrance by his spirit in our life. The Holy Spirit is the reminder for us. Do you need a reminder ever? Like, how long does it take us to figure out the basics of life? One of my favorite descriptions of the Christian life is from Ray Ortland. I've said this a lot. I'll say it more times than you care for me to say it, but I'm going to keep saying it. He says, what is a good church environment? It's one that has the gospel, it has safety, and it has time. It has all three of those ingredients. The gospel, good news, truth. It also has safety, places where people can wrestle with these things. Because you don't just change your thoughts overnight. And then you need time. Why do we need time? Because we are a forgetful bunch. We're an ignorant bunch, and then we learn it, and then we forget it, and we need to be reminded. And the Spirit says, I'll remind you. I'll bring to my, I'll recall all that you need to recall. I am the Spirit. I am the reminder. And then finally, what does the Spirit do? He brings the peace of Jesus. Verse 27, right before Jesus says, rise. Are you ready? Let's roll. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And then he goes on, I'm going away, rise, let's go. But the last thing he says, I will give you my peace. How does God give us his peace, his shalom, his perfect harmony? By his spirit. Like what better gift can we give the world that does not have peace than to be a peaceful bunch? And peaceful in this context does not mean we don't fight, we don't have strong opinions. It means at our core, we have restored harmony with God and with ourselves. We have this shalom, this peace, this deep peace that the world cannot give. Jesus says, the world can't give this to you. I give it to you. And now the Spirit has given us his peace. The kingdom of God is manifested through Jesus-loving, Spirit-filled followers of Jesus. Jesus wants to remind us, and then he says, rise, let us go from here. As I've prepped for this, I think more than anything, I was convicted that I don't think about the Spirit nearly enough. I don't lean on the Spirit nearly enough. I kind of take him for granted. I love Jesus. I love the cross. I love the resurrection. I love praying to the Father. But when it comes to the Spirit, this mysterious third person of the Trinity, I just neglect him. 
Francis Chan, an author, pastor, wrote a book, Forgotten God, and he says this. It's talking about the Spirit. From my perspective, the Holy Spirit is tragically neglected and for all practical purposes probably forgotten. While no Christian would deny his existence, I'm willing to bet there are millions of churchgoers across America who cannot confidently say that they have experienced the Holy Spirit's presence or action in their lives over the past year. And many of them do not believe they ever can. This passage from Jesus before he goes to the cross says, the Spirit will do the work. You will be fine. Not because there's something in you, disciples, or you Christians, but because the Spirit is great. He's the helper. It's going to be very good that he comes. How can we get more in tune with the Spirit? I wrote down four things, and we'll pray. Spend some time this week just acknowledging him. If he's always there, it's our job to acknowledge his presence. It's like you wouldn't have somebody in your house and never acknowledge him. You might, but people don't come back to those houses. <laughs> thank him this week. Spirit, thank you. Thank him for specific moments where you know you had nothing to give and the Spirit gave. Talk to him this week. Spirit, you know what I'm dealing with at work. You know about my husband. Spirit, help me. And then lastly, this is where it gets a little scary because it, we don't have control, but listen to him. The Spirit's still speaking. According to this passage, the Spirit is very active. He seems to be the most active part of the Trinity here on earth in this current moment. Listen for him. It takes stopping and pausing and God speak. The Holy Spirit is a gift God has given us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your reminder of what the spirit is before Jesus went away. Thank you that you've given us enough to know that the spirit is alive and active, and yet you've also left a bit of a mystery to the spirit. which makes our relationship unique and beautiful. That we know he's here, we know he's alive, we know he's active, we know he's at work, and yet how he works and when he works can often be a mystery. I pray that mystery would not push us away from you, but pull us into deeper communion and relationship with you. That we would want to know you more and that we would want to know you more by your spirit that we as a church that would be a spirit-filled bunch, that we would be able to point to many things in our lives, in our homes, with our family and friends, where it was the spirit that gets the credit for what happened there. God, I don't want to be a part of a church or a group of people that has lots of accolades and resume to point to, but I'd love to be a part of a group that can constantly say, that was the spirit. That was the Spirit. That was the Spirit. So God, be with us again as we close out this morning. And by your Spirit, be with us this week and give us very specific moments where we are reminded of your Spirit's presence, your Spirit's power, and your Spirit's teaching and reminding in our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray.